We already made a data structure that we can use to construct a hierarchy of submeshes. This is the geometry hierarchy, which consists of at least one level of detail, or LOD, and each LOD has at least one submesh. In context of rendering, we refer to this hierarchy as a geometry. Rendering a submesh is the job of the low level renderer. When rendering a submesh, we might use textures for different surface properties of the object. Use of textures is optional, since we can also use a constant color or some procedurally generated coloring scheme to render the submesh. However, most submeshes in a typical game do use textures in general. In addition to textures, we need to write little programs that run on the GPU, which we call shaders. In order to render a submesh, we need at least two shaders, a vertex shader and a pixel shader. In the future, we might also want to support mesh shaders. In that case, we need a mesh shader and a pixel shader. The shaders will use the mesh data and the textures to output the final pixel cover on screen. The collection of shaders and textures define a material which is used to render a submesh. In Primal Engine, we refer to this combination of a submesh and a material as a render item. At a low level, one submesh is used with one material, and the job of the low level renderer is to take a list of such render items and render it as quickly as possible. At a higher level, we can associate a list of materials with the list of submeshes in a geometry hierarchy. This is the high level render item. We can define multiple render items that use the same geometry with a different list of materials. In this episode, we are going to work on high level render items and compiling and organizing shaders so that they can be used in a material. We are going to work on the low-level render items and materials in the next episode. Since textures are optional, I'll postpone importing and using textures to a later episode. Previously, we started working on the render item, which is a data structure that functions as a link between the geometry, the entity that owns that geometry, and the materials that are needed in order to render that geometry. It basically connects everything together that a low-level renderer needs in order to render an object. We already defined the high-level render item in our code. However, before writing the code for the low-level render items, we really need to implement low-level materials in the renderer. So, as we can see here, at a higher level, a material is just a list of textures and the shaders that will take the geometry, sample the textures, and finally output the pixels on the screen that belong to that object. In reality, we can define a lot of properties for a material. For example, the material type, blend mode, refraction index, and much more. However, let's start with a simple material model with just one property, which is the material type. The material type, together with shaders and textures, will define a high-level material that can be used as an input for the low-level renderer. From this information, we can create a block of memory that contains the material type, shader flags, the root signature, number of textures, and the IDs of the shaders and textures. Additionally, it will also contain an array of descriptor indices that will be used in the shaders to index into the descriptor heap when sampling textures. The details for this will become clear later when we write our shaders. However, for now it's important to note that the shader flags is just a 32-bit unsigned integer that has the bits that correspond to each shader stage that is used for this material set to 1. Using these flags, we can know how many shaders are used as well as which shader stages are used. The same shader code can be used for different materials and therefore also the same root signature can be used for multiple materials. Because the material type and the set of shaders will determine the data that is available to each shader stage, we can use them as a key to a set of root signatures. That way we don't have to create a root signature for every single material. In this video, we are going to introduce functions that will read the data in our data structures, which is needed for rendering objects. Looking at what we have so far, we see that we pack our geometry data in blocks of memory in this format with references to the submesh data for this geometry. The submesh data contains mainly information about the content that's uploaded to the GPU. We also have materials which have a similar format in the sense that they are packed in blocks of memory with references to shaders and textures. If you haven't seen the videos where I explain these data structures in more detail, feel free to stop the video and watch those first, 
because you need to be familiar with how and why the data is packed this way in order to understand the code that we are going to write in this video. Looking at how the data is allocated in memory, we see that most of the time our memory blocks are allocated separately and therefore could be scattered in the memory. Sometimes we do manage to pack them in an array, which is better. As we know, keeping memory allocations close to each other improves cache coherency. However, even if you would succeed in packing all our information in a contiguous block of memory, rendering a scene inherently makes it impossible to access data sequentially. For example, in this scene from an undisclosed video game, you can see that the data that we need to access for rendering highly depends on where in the scene the camera is looking. Here we can see clearly that even for the data in an array, the access is quite random. And it's even worse when we have to go through this data multiple times for different render passes. We can improve this situation by going through the pain of reading this data once and then cache it in a way that can be used sequentially. Although data access is random for different camera views, it is completely determined during the same frame. So if you would cache everything in camera's view for the current frame, we could read it sequentially as often as needed, which in theory would cause fewer cache misses. In the first half of this video, we'll construct these caches for submeshes and materials, and then we continue with implementing render items. We use low-level render items to tell the renderer how it should render the submeshes that make up the scene. Obviously, we need to give the renderer the submesh data, but it also needs to know which shaders to use and which textures to sample from. It also needs a transform matrix in order to position the submesh in the scene. We can provide the renderer with a set of IDs that can be used to gather this information. This set of IDs is the low-level render item which is created per submesh. That means that a geometry that consists of one or more submeshes will result in a list of render items. We can put the indices to this list of render items together with the ID of the geometry in the block of memory and add a pointer to that into another list. The index of that pointer in this list is the render item ID for the whole geometry. To calculate the hash, I'm going to use an intrinsic function for cyclic redundancy check, also known as CRC32. These are functions that take up to 8 bytes and compute the CRC value for the data in those bytes. Of course, most of the time our data is larger than 8 bytes, so we need to feed it into this function in chunks of 8 bytes and use the CRC of the previous 8 bytes to compute a new CRC value. We repeat this process until we reach the end of our data buffer. For this to work, we need to align our data size up to 8 bytes. That means that we might end up with some unused space at the end of the buffer where we place our pipeline subobject stream, which is fine as long as we fill the unused bytes with zeros. Looking at the state of transform component as it is now, we see that any module, for example script or physics, can read data that's held by the transform component module. Reading data can happen by any module and on any thread. Obviously, if you wanted to update any of these components, you'd have to take on a challenging task of synchronizing reads and writes. Besides the fact that this would complicate the code considerably, it would also impact the performance of the engine. On top of that, you would still need to define which modules would have precedence over any other module which results in even greater complication of the code. The way I'm going to tackle these problems is by caching any changes that a module makes to transform components during each frame. The consequence of this is that each module has its own cache and that updating any transform component is not reflected in the transform values until the next frame. This may sound odd at first, but makes sense if we consider the fact that one frame is the smallest time interval of the game world and entities are not going to move within the time span of one frame, during which the world is basically static. In other words, the game world advances in discrete time steps, with each step being as long as one frame. Now everyone can read from the transform component anytime, and since each module that needs to update transform components has its own cache, synchronizing writes is only needed within the module if the module uses multiple threads. 
In order to get all updates into transform component module, we are going to have a point in the current frames timeline where everyone agrees that there will be no more reads from the transform module. After this barrier, each module can call an update function that will write the changes from the cache to transform module. Although it would be easy to serialize this part using a lock and mutex, we'll need to manually define some kind of priority between the modules. So for example, if an object is falling due to gravity, that means that a physics module will be updating the position of that object. However, if there is also a script that's trying to move that object because of user interactions, we need to decide which update will take effect. So this is not a matter of multi-threading, but one of engine design. Let me explain the problem with depth precision first. Starting with the refresher of the projection matrix, which I discussed more in detail in this video. Given any point in view space, which is a space relative to the camera's coordinate system, with the camera at the origin, the projection matrix will map that point to homogeneous clip space. We see that the W component contains the negative Z coordinate of the point. This is because we want to fit every point in homogeneous clip space into normalized device coordinates, and to encode depth information in a range between 0 and 1, we need to divide this vector by the value in the W component. This is called the perspective divide, which brings our point fully into the NDC space. Again, I already made a video about this, so if you'd like a more detailed explanation, please go ahead and watch that video. Now if we look at the z-coordinate after perspective divide, we see that it's no longer a linear function because of the division by z. If we plot 1 over z, we can clearly see that it's not a straight line. Instead, it uses up a lot of precision of the normalized depth value in a relatively small region close to the camera and quickly loses resolution at points that are farther away. This will introduce artifacts when rendering far away objects that are close to each other, which is also known as Z-fighting. Fortunately, there is one easy to implement trick that considerably improves depth precision, which is done by simply reversing the depth range in NDC space. So on default, the depth value ranges from 0 for near objects to 1 for far objects. If we instead use 1 for near objects and 0 for far objects, the nonlinear distribution of points in 1 over z will be cancelled by increasing precision of depth values when approaching 0. In this graph, we can see that the resolution worsens rather quickly for default floating point depth. However, it remains well behaved when using the reversed depth. I'd like to recommend reading the articles linked in the video description for better understanding of depth precision in general. I also need to mention that this only works if the depth range is within 0 and 1. 